comprises a number of tea and talk events which are on a daily basis, which were inspired by the coffee house discussions of the Scottish Enlightenment, where people would gather to debate the issues of the day. The one hour long tea and talk sessions will take place at 3 p.m. every day on Zoom, except on the 30th of August and are free to attend. But we would encourage you um, to register early for the events as places may be limited. Some larger events will also take place, this being one of them. Um, and there are a number of other group panel sessions as well as um, lectures as well. So please visit the Curious website to see what is on offer. Today, however, I'm going to introduce you to three amazing speakers who will take turns giving their perspective on forensic science and fiction. After this, we're going to have a challenge. We're going to challenge you to take part in a short quiz. Um, and I will introduce that and explain how to do that when we come to it. After that, uh, we will finish with a short Q&A session where you'll have the chance to ask the panel questions. Um, and I would encourage you to post questions um, throughout the, the time that they're speaking. So just go to, in order to post a question, if you just go to the bottom of your screen, you'll see a um, icon that says Q&A. If you just open that up and post a question in there, I'll try and make sure that it's asked of our panel once we come time to do that. Just to let you know, the session will be recorded and will be um, available on the YouTube um, RSE YouTube area. So I'm going to um, stop talking in a second, but first I'm going to introduce Professor Lorna Dawson, who is head of the Soil Forensics Group within the, the Environmental and Biochemical Sciences Group at the James Hutton Institute, based up in Aberdeen. She has over 30 years experience in research in soil and plant interactions and how this applies to the criminal justice system. And she's going to share some of her knowledge with us now. Thank you. Good afternoon. Thank you, Lucina. Um, so welcome, everyone. And I'm going to just start by talking about what forensic soil science is. And now it's really part of the whole principle that was established by Edward Locard, which is, as I'm sure you're all aware, that every contact leaves a trace. He described soil particles as dust or dirt but it's all part of the whole hair, fiber, soil, plant fragment, the physical evidence that can be taken into or out of a crime scene. But the work that we do is not done in isolation. No forensic sciences. Forensic soil science is one of the many sciences that delivers to the criminal justice system. And in the background there, there is science and research that feeds into that, developing new methods and new approaches that can be adopted but we work closely with law enforcement and also with the whole lawyers and judges, and of course, the important triers of fact, you, potentially the jury. But I'm one of the ologists, the pedologist, as I am, a geologist, ecologist, geographer, all these things interact, taphonomist, entomologist, we've got Lucina as an anthropologist, archeologist, palynologist, botanist. We all work together in different ways, delivering, different types of expertise, depending on the type of criminal question that we've been asked to assist with. You come to a scene. That scene, if it's an outdoor scene, will involve environmental um, information that can be used either as intelligence to help the police in their investigations or potentially as evidence in court. A murder can take once, but that crime scene can be murdered many times if it's not well controlled, and the people that are invited onto that scene have to be adequately protected in wearing full PPE. Now, I'm sure we're all aware now with this horrible COVID-19 that we're living with, the need to protect ourselves from breathing and touching. Well, that's the very principle of wearing adequate PPE at a crime scene, not only to protect the forensic scientists, but also to, to protect that crime scene. So as a forensic soil scientist, we look for potential areas that soil can be transferred, the, the fingernails of the victim, footwear, hair, and collect that sample in a very robust and straightforward and standardized manner, collect it and store it as evidence. Now that can lead to questions to where could that soil have come from? So we look for exhibits such as footwear, tools, and vehicles any material that could have come into contact with soil or vegetation 
at or near or accessing the crime scene. But it's not only that physical information about soil, geology, vegetation, the land use at a particular location, but that links very much to the intelligence that the police have derived from their inquiries and that coupled together within geographical information. So it's all georeferenced information we can narrow down and exclude. And what we can do is look for potential links between a questioned item such as the foot of a victim and that of the, the footwear or the vehicles of a suspect as to where it could potentially have come from. And it's very important that we work with the, the professional communicators, the crime authors, um, the TV production companies. They are the real professionals at communication. So, for example, um, I've worked with BBC Silent Witness and in the particular item here on Two Spirits, I worked very closely to ensure that they were realistic in using the appropriate methods and approaches and procedures. And they built into that particular episode a geographical information that was based on soil and plant information. However, there were some things that weren't quite to truth. However, it is entertainment after all. And the, the, the fact that we've also worked with um, crime authors such as Val from Lynn Anderson, who has put in that whole concept of soil being embedded in the grooves of, of, of boots and vehicles, can tell about the information, a place that she was setting up in the Northern Isles in her book, None But the Dead. And in Aberdeen, um, Stuart McBride, he brought in the concept in his book of two different layers. The idea that there can be material brought from one particular uh, crime scene to another. So the find site may in fact not be the initial burial site. Again, this is something that is found in actual crime and it's mirrored in these books of fiction. And also in Glasgow, we've got Alex Gray and Lynn Anderson who also make sure that they do their research to ensure that what they're talking about is credible in terms of police procedure and also the forensic work that's, that's um, described. And also down to, to Fife, Edinburgh and the Lothians, we've got today our own Val and, and also Ian, Ian Rankin, who uses soil as, as makes sure that he uses adequate um, information appropriate to that which is used in current forensic science approaches. Um, I do thank him for saying that I'm in my early 40s with long brown hair. Um, and I do agree that we have we got the data from a few crumbs of soil. And indeed, it can be so small now that the person who has committed the crime does not even know that they've carried it out on their feet. And when I asked Ian about why he, he does that rigorous research, he said that um, it's because it can give the clues that the car had somewhere from the location where it had been discovered. He said it gave him an extra puzzle for the reader and his detective to solve. He thinks that science and technology are crucial to the investigation of crime. Readers know this, so he thinks authors should also take account of this. But I'm sure you hear more from Val on that later. And Lynn says that it provides authenticity and knowledge which the readers crave and they deserve. And Val herself said it's the power of setting. And if you write about a place and soil science and geography is about place in a way that someone knows that place, they're with you. They're with you in that book. They trust you and they also uh, believe it and understand it. And so when they, if they are asked to be a trier of fact in a jury, they will be armed with the right information, not unrealistic. Unrealistic CSI type images. Never would you approach a crime scene with high heels and hair unprotected. Um, never would you wear a Gucci suit like that. That is what I look like at a crime scene. And in the lab, you would not have people coming in. You would not have chemicals, wet chemistry out while looking down a microscope, looking at an exhibit it would be careful, even although it's dirt you're looking at, there could be hidden clues within that soil. There could be DNA later required to be recovered. And ultimately in court, um, we are not experts that are hired guns as sometimes these CSI movies that portray us. We actually are there to be 
duty to the court and be objective and impartial. And that's why in collaboration with Modern Studies Association and the Faculty of Advocates, we try to educate the young people, the future generation of decision makers. And context is everything. Um, uh, context, whether that's in the field, working out where something come, came from, or context in making a decision, whether a piece of evidence is credible or not. Thank you for listening. Over to you, Lucina. Thank you very much, Lorna. Um, what we need to do now, I think, is to move on to our next speaker. Um, I, Val McDermott has already been introduced to you. Um, she needs very little introduction from me. Um, she is one of the biggest names in crime writing and she's a celebrated and best-selling Scottish author with a host of books to her name. So I'm just going to pass you straight over to Val. Thanks, Lucina. It's always a pleasure to spend time with forensic scientists. Uh, unfortunately, when we're doing it virtually, we're doing it without cake, which is normally a feature of all our meetings. So today we are doing this, as I say, virtually, so there's no cake. Now, I have to say that my career as a crime writer has kind of gone in lockstep with modern forensic science. The first case involving DNA in a courtroom happened in 1986, and my first novel was published in 1987. Uh, at that point, fingerprints were really the, the high watermark of physical forensic science. Uh, we know now that there are many question marks over fingerprints, that they are more of an art than a science, but back then they were regarded as the equivalent of Bible truth. Uh, in my second novel, I used some elements of forensic computing. Uh, in the very earliest days of, of computers, when you had your program on a cassette tape, which you then plugged into a cassette recorder, plugged into the computer to load a program. So that was a very early use for me of digital forensics. Uh, and I think all along I have wanted to stay abreast of what's happening in the scientific world because that underpins what I'm trying to do as a writer. Um, I have to say that everybody knows that murders are not solved the way we write about them in our books or portray them on television. It's not Detective Inspector Grumpy and his sidekick who has to buy all the drinks that actually go out there and solve murders. It's a lot of tedious door-to-door -door interviewing, covering the ground again and again and again before answers are found. But that doesn't make for very dramatic viewing or reading. And so we need a way to convince readers that we're telling you the truth. And one of the ways we can do that is to be accurate about the forensic science. If I'm telling you the truth about how a crime is solved in, in terms of the scientific evidence, then I think you're more inclined to believe all the lies I'm telling you about the other stuff. For me, uh, the, my involvement with forensic science and forensic scientists began by accident in the early 1990s. I was doing a radio programme uh, based in Glasgow, uh, but I was in Manchester, and the other person on the radio programme was Sue Black, now Professor Dame Sue Black, but back in those days, just Dr. Sue Black. And we were talking to each other off air and she said something very foolish that I think she has lived to regret. She said, anytime you need any forensic information, just give me a call. If I don't know the answer myself, I can find you somebody that does. I kind of rubbed my hand in glee and noted her phone number down on a piece of paper. Within weeks, I was calling her up to ask her about something in uh, my novel, The Wire and the Blood. Uh, and she's been on speed dial ever since, basically. Um, one of the wonderful things about Sue is that she's a very good communicator. And that's a feature I have discovered runs common through many forensic scientists and their work, the way they communicate with us very directly uh, and in ways that, frankly, I don't need to even try as a writer. They're often ready for the books. Uh, I remember once asking Sue, what someone would look like if they'd been in a peat bog for 200 years. And she thought for a moment and said, a leather bag with a face on. If you've read the book in question, 
you will recognise that because it dropped straight in. And that's how it's gone over the years with, with Sue and many other friends at scientists, including the people here today, Lucina and Lorna and Neve. Uh, I have I've exploited all of them at one time or another. Um, and even in my latest book, which is about to come out, Still Dead, that's the commercial break, uh, there's another Sue Black line uh, describing maggot cases as looking like a pile of cocoa pops. And if that doesn't put you off your breakfast, I don't know what will. It's hard to keep abreast sometimes of the latest developments in forensic science because the science moves so quickly. And that in a way is a warning for crime writers. Uh, we should, it's easy to fall in love with the science because it is, it's full of wow moments and it's full of things that make your head go spinning and ideas start turning over in your mind. And it's easy to fall in love with the technology and the science and forget that what you're writing is a story. And if you don't engage with the characters, then all the science in the world is not gonna make it come alive. And the problem with books that rely too heavily on the science and the technology is that in two years time, they're out of date. And when someone picks it up, all they notice is the science is out of date. So the science always has to be at the service of the story. It's, it's that mixture of getting it accurate and, and getting it not in the forefront to, to, to a degree. And uh, I think one of the, the things that, that helps with that is when you actually sit down and talk to forensic scientists and they tell you about what they do. You know, I always go with a handful of questions uh, about the, the particular novel I'm writing. But what I don't know to ask are the questions that I don't know to ask. If you go to a library or go to the internet and you ask your questions, you will get answers. But what you won't get is that whole conversation about the answers, around the answers. And in the course of that conversation, someone will say, oh, and a funny thing happened in the lab the other week. Or they'll tell you about an interesting piece of research that they're working on, uh, something that, that suddenly makes sense of, of things that have previously been completely opaque. Uh, an example of that uh, was, was a few years ago, uh, again, Sue Black was, was telling me uh, about a particular discovery that had been, been made. Um, in our, our, the cells in our body renew themselves over a period of about seven years, you probably know this. Um, and so seven years on, you're a completely different physical entity from the one you were seven years ago. But there is an exception to this. Apparently there's a tiny bone in the ear. It's a bone so small that for years it wasn't even counted by anatomists as being part of the human skeleton. But this tiny bone apparently stays the same from the womb to the tomb. Now that in itself is amazing enough. But of course, because of what they can do with stable isotope analysis now, if this bone is analysed and compared to what we know about soil factors and air factors, it can tell you where your mother was living when she was pregnant with you. Now, if you don't go wow at that moment, there is something wrong with you, frankly. Uh, and immediately I was starting to think about how I could maybe use this in a plot. But in the meantime, I thought I'll just drop it in in passing in the next book, which I duly did, only to get a phone call from Sue saying, you might have waited till I'd published the paper, which put me in my place, I have to say, that was me telt. Um, but I love the fact that, uh, as I say, when we go with, with one question, we get other questions answered. And, and I love the way, too, that these answers don't always involve high-tech science. Sometimes they involve nothing more than a trip to the supermarket. A couple of years ago, I was wanting to start a fire in a car, uh, and I, I, was, I was sitting down talking to Neve Nick Dade about this, and Neve said, crisps. I said, what, crisps? And she said, yeah, crisps, multi-pack of crisps, all that plastic, all that oil goes up like a torch. And I thought, there's going to be a lot of people when they read this who are going to be very, very wary about putting the multi-pack of crisps in the car next time they come back from the supermarket. So it's, I love that, that there are these elements, as I say, of high science, but also the everyday that creeps in and has its consequences. Of course, sometimes we deliberately get it wrong. Some years ago, I wrote a book that involved blowing up a small airplane in 1974. Uh, and I had a great afternoon with Neve in the lab, blowing things up in the, in the fume cupboard uh, and deciding which particular kind of bomb we were going to make with readily available ingredients that would take this small plane out of the skies. 
And I, I, we settled on the thing, I got the recipe, I went away and I wrote the book, but I inserted a deliberate mistake because the last thing I want to be doing is giving people the means to, by which to make a bomb. And the thing that was most amusing to me was when the book was published, I had several emails and messages. And I have to say, guys, I don't, I don't mean this in any sexist way, but they were all men claiming, telling me, reminding me that I had got it wrong and that I might like to correct this for the paperback edition. No, sorry, not correcting it for the paperback edition. The mistake stays in. I wish I could say the same for a lot of the, the, the television examples of, of forensic science. Uh, and uh, we'll be talking about some of these shortly. Um, but I think the one that, that probably drives me most mad is the forensic scientists who do everything and who know everything. You know, you know what I'm talking about. There's one forensic scientist and she does everything. She does the DNA, she does the toxicology, she does the forensic anthropology, she does the forensic chemistry, and she makes the tea as well. Uh, it's completely unrealistic. Um, and I do find that it's, that's the thing that tends to make me go, oh, for heaven's sake, I'm not watching any more of this. Um, I'm sure if many of you have these moments, uh, and probably when you're reading crime novels as well, because I'll be honest, we don't always get it right. And I understand that sometimes dramatic necessity plays a part in this, but I do think that uh, we do have a kind of duty to try and make it as authentic as we possibly can, because people who sit on juries often have their opinions formed by what they've read or what they've seen on television. And if we give them the wrong information, if we feed them misinformation, then I think we may be storing up problems for ourselves in the criminal justice system. But for me, I just keep on making it up with the help of my friends in the business. Uh, and I'm very grateful for their generosity with their time and their expertise. Uh, and, and I think it's, it's extraordinary how, how much time they're willing to spend with those of us who essentially just make it up. Thank you very much, Val. Thank you. So um, keep your questions coming in. I see some people have already asked some questions. So keep uh, putting them there so that we can ask them of our panel uh, later. I'm just going to introduce our next speaker, who's Professor Neve McDade. She's director of the Leverhulme Research Centre of Forensic Science um, at the University of Dundee and is a forensic chemist with specialisms including fire investigation, clandestine, uh, drug chemistry and explosives. So without further ado, I'm going to hand you over to Ni. Thank you very much uh, indeed, Lucina, um, and also to the Royal Society of Edinburgh for putting on this great event and for gathering this little um, rat bag of individuals to come and speak to you today. Um, what I was going to do was, was maybe talk a little bit um, around uh, who I am and how I became involved in forensic science. And then also um, uh, talk a little bit about what the, the, the future landscape, I think, of forensic science and forensic practice, uh, what it might look like, where it certainly needs to go in terms of um, the, the, the nature of the science that we do. Um, and I'll also speak a little bit about um, uh, the interactions that we've had with, with Val and with other um, uh, people involved in both uh, putting our science into um, uh, fictional aspects and space, but also where that can, can really have an impact in terms of um, how members of the public, such as yourselves, um, uh, view science and view the importance of it or otherwise uh, in regards to um, investigating criminal events. So I'll try and get all of that into 10 minutes. Um, where, where do I come from? Well, I'm um, originally, um, uh, I did my undergraduate degree in chemistry and in mathematics. So I have got a, a very strong uh, background within the natural sciences. And I often get asked a question around whether or not um, uh, your, uh, your forensic science undergraduate degrees are the right direction to go in terms of educating the generation of scientists that go in and do this kind of work um, for our justice systems. And my response is always the same, which is when you're looking at um, becoming a forensic scientist, one of the key and most important things that forensic science needs, in my view at least, is we need people who are 
very strong in natural sciences. So whether it's chemistry, physics, uh, biology, uh, zoology, or whatever it might be, geology, et cetera. Um, we need people who are numerate, so people who can do the mathematics. Um, and we need that first, and we can add the skills that forensic scientists then uh, are required to have, like problem solving and other aspects of um, the work in after they get those fundamental scientific foundations. So when I um, did my degree, I left, um, uh, when I finished university, I went off and I did a PhD uh, again in chemistry, this time in bio inorganic chemistry, a field of chemistry, it doesn't exist anymore. Um, and from there, I started, once I finished my PhD, um, I started working at the University of Strathclyde in Glasgow um, in a, a forensic science department. Um, and that was kind of where and how I got involved in, in the forensic science business. Um, well, kind of. Um, I come from a, a, a family who were themselves um, both scientists, both my parents were scientists, um, but who were themselves also forensic scientists. So my mother is a botanist, my father was an organic chemist, and they, back in, you're talking maybe 40 years ago, they got involved in forensic science kind of sideways, um, because my dad was asked uh, his opinion on how a particular scenario might work for a fire to start in a building. And they began doing work on fire scene investigation, pretty much self-taught, pretty much learning as they go um, and learning from experience, but also bringing to bear their knowledge of the natural world of a chemistry, of physics and of biology and botany in, in my mum's uh, case, um, where the, the core essence of what they used and needed in order to understand how fires start and develop was all around the chemistry of materials and substances that go on fire. And having that core information and core understanding was absolutely critical to and remains critical to understanding how materials can go on fire and how fires develop. So I had, I had a, a really strong um, grounding in this from the time that I can remember really uh, at home in part of our home life because my parents um, ran uh, ultimately started their own company and ran that as a fire investigation company and um, so I was exposed to this from a very early age and also it was the topic of conversation around the dinner table it was how myself and my brother earned our pocket money by sticking photographs onto sheets of paper to go into uh, fire reports that mum and dad were preparing and it was always something that was there but what it what it taught me as a scientist was that science can really be useful uh, one of one of the the mantras of the royal society of edinburgh that knowledge uh, um, held into um, the, the exploration of the natural world can actually turn into something that has got practical usability in, pro in solving problems relating, in this case, to fires. So when I started my academic career, I started it um, also uh, as, a, as a practicing forensic scientist uh, doing fire scene investigations, not at any level close to people who do the job all the time, but as an academic where um, my services were called upon um, if for particular circumstances and situations. Um, as uh, Lucina said at the beginning, I'm, I'm fundamentally an analytical chemist, so I also did a lot of research work around drug chemistry, particularly um, studying the um, illicit or clandestine manufacture of drugs like amphetamines, um, ecstasy, a um, little bit on other um, uh, synthetic drugs and, and uh, formed a research group uh, around that area specifically. Um, and uh, um, home office licensed to, to hold, to produce, to um, uh, uh, examine those kind of materials. And so everything was going swimmingly well um, in terms of, of the development of that work and, and how my career was developing. Um, until in 2014, I decided to take the big step of leaving University of Strathclyde, where I had been for over 20 years, and joining the University of Dundee, <clears throat> where I work currently. And one of the um, catalyst moments of that move was a, a, a growing discomfort around the level and uh, really robust scientific nature of some of the forensic, some of the techniques that are being used uh, by forensic scientists and others in, in looking at uh, matters relating to, to um, criminal activity. And it, it, certainly in, in, in the, the mid to late 2000s, um, uh, there was a, a growing external pressure 
being put on forensic science and forensic scientists to account for the level and robustness of science that underpins the things that we do. So how do we know for certain, or can we know for certain, that a particular shoe left a particular footwear mark? Or can we know for certain that a particular <clears throat> um, gun fired a particular bullet? And how, where's the robustness and the science behind those, those conclusions that forensic practitioners might, um, might, might uh, deliver and develop? And secondly, how do we articulate that? How do we talk about that in our reports when we um, go to court, such that the jury understand and recognize what it is that we're doing and whether or not what we're doing has got that scientific robustness behind it? So these are all fundamentally important questions. Um, and uh, as we were starting to explore all of that area, um, uh, I worked with, with um, Sue Black, who's also been mentioned earlier by Val, as we began to explore the, those areas and these really quite um, important and, and pretty impactful questions, uh, we came upon an opportunity to write a grant proposal like all good academics do. Um, and we were successful in, in um, securing funding for, uh, to start a, a whole research program looking at aspects of forensic science where the science might be a little bit rocky and might be a little bit less robust than perhaps we would like it to be. Um, and we, we um, established the Levy Hume Research Centre for Forensic Science, which I now direct. Um, the grant was, was by all accounts, reasonably um, impactful. Um, the, the, the Levy Hume Trust, who are our funders, um, took, I think, a very brave uh, and bold and courageous step in giving two middle-aged um, uh, Celtic women 10 million pounds over 10 years to explore and, and demystify or bust the myths of um, various aspects of forensic science in terms of practice and how we can look at the robustness of the science behind it. So the Livium Centre has been up and running now for, uh, we're just going into our fifth year, and we're now a complement of nearly 46 researchers, and um, so it's grown uh, reasonably large in that length of time. And what we're doing is we're, we're bringing into the forensic science, both research and practitioner space, science that has been running along in parallel to what we do um, and has been developing but hasn't really impacted on the nature of the work that much forensic science still relies on. So to give you a very quick example, um, we look at DNA. DNA is probably the most um, understood and most familiar evidence type that uh, exists uh, across, across our domain. And the DNA analysis that we do within the forensic domain really sits uh, back in or began back in the 1980s, so about 35 years ago, where um, Sir Alec Jeffries discovered uh, the whole aspect and area of being able to link um, individuals to their um, uh, genetic material and created DNA fingerprinting. Um, what he looked at was very small areas of DNA, only about 10 initially of these little pieces of DNA, and that's what we use to fingerprint you in your genetic fingerprint. That's now evolved, and we now look at 17 uh, little pieces of your DNA, or in uh, Scotland, 24. And Scotland is the most advanced country in the world for doing uh, its scrutiny of DNA in terms of being able to link it to you as an individual. What the world did outside of us, running along in parallel, was they sequenced the whole human genome. So they look at every part of DNA for things like personalized medicine or toxicogenomics or, or, or aspects of uh, medical health in that regard. What forensic scientists have done is they haven't moved with that particular technological development. And we still look at very small bits of DNA in pretty much similar way that we did 35 years ago. So part of what we're doing within the Leverhulme Human Center is looking at what's going on in the outside world uh, outside of forensic science and seeing whether or not we can bring that into, um, uh, uh, into our space to see will it make a difference, will it help in answering some of the really um, critical and important questions around uh, identifying individuals or telling and un unfurling the story of what happened uh, to a particular individual given a particular set of circumstances. And that's really a very complicated um, uh, aspect and issue uh, to, to unpick and to unpack. The final thing that I'll say is, well, two final things. Um, one is that within the Levy Hume Centre, one of the things that makes what we do now really different from what we've done in the past 
is that we involve the entirety of our community. And again, it mirrors um, the, 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 the approach that's taken of um, the National Scientific Academies, but particularly the Royal Society of Edinburgh, where back in the Scottish Enlightenment, it brought together, it provided an opportunity to bring together scientists from all areas of science, but not just scientists. The RSE also brought into the fold lawyers and artists and writers and poets and engineers and medics and people from right the way across the spectrum of society. And that's what we do within the Liebigheim Centre. We bring together not just the crime scene investigators and the police and the forensic scientists, but also scientists from outside of our domain and also the writers and the filmmakers and the, the creative um, uh, uh, um, humanities together with law and the judiciary to bring a very different perspective on the challenges that science faces within the courts, such that we can listen to everyone's perspective of how that science might be being communicated or what concerns and limitations that science might have and how we can then do research to bring the science up to the level um, of, of requirement for, for legal scrutiny. My last point was, um, I didn't teach Val McDermott how to blow things up in my fume cupboard, just in case my um, uh, colleagues at the university are um, watching. We did a very, very small little tiny explosion in a little metal tin that kind of blew the top off the tin a bit, but it was really controlled and really contained. So just so that my university knows that. Uh, and that's all I have to say. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Neve. We're quite relieved that that was all that was exploding within the university, being someone that's also on site. Um, so uh, what we'll do now, I um, hope you've all been paying attention to what our speakers have been saying, is we're going to um, test you on your knowledge in relation to forensic science. We're going to show you three scenarios um, and we're going to ask you to vote on each to decide whether or not that uh, what you're seeing is based on proper forensic science or is pure fiction. So we'll start with the first scenario. So you'll, what you'll see is you'll see the, an image and then you'll see a voting screen. So please vote as soon as you've seen it. The first scenario, and you'll have seen this in many TV programs, is a cigarette lighting a pool of petrol. You'll all have seen um, the bad guy or, or girl throwing a cigarette onto a pool of petrol and it catching fire. And I'm going to give you no hints in relation to this. So I'm just describing the scenario. So if you could vote on that. And once we have the vote in, then we'll find out which way everybody voted. Do we have the vote? So we've got 34% of you thought it was fact, and we've got 66% of you think it's fiction. So any of our panelists like to comment on that scenario? I just have to say, 34% of you, oh my goodness me, it is utter fiction. Utter fiction. <laughs> Thank you very much. So whenever you see that um, on TV, you'll know now that it's actual fiction. Why is it fiction, Professor McDaid? Oh, thank you so much. Um, th th there's a number of reasons for it. Um, one is that in order for a fire to occur and develop, you first need to produce vapour. So you need localised heat, not in petrol. Petrol produces vapour anyway because you can smell it. But you need to produce localised heat. You need to produce it to such a degree that you cause the material that you're uh, trying to set on fire to vaporise, to thermally decompose and create uh, vapours and fumes. And it's those fumes mixed with oxygen that will um, enable combustion to occur. When you take a lit cigarette, the coal of a cigarette um, is, has a temperature of about anywhere, it, it varies depending on, on how you test it and what literature you see and whether or not you're smoking it and dragging from it and so on. But it has a temperature of approximately 700 degrees centigrade. So it's pretty hot, but the duration of it in contact with the vapor from petrol, which is usually outside in the scenarios in the films, is simply not long enough for ignition to occur of the vapors that you can smell in your pool of petrol. And what will happen in reality is if you smoke your cigarette and you flick it into your pool of petrol is that the petrol will simply extinguish the cigarette. Not something I would suggest you try, 
just, you know, you never know, the 34% might be right, not something I suggest you try. But um, there's been a lot of repetitive testing, particularly around this issue done by colleagues over in the United States, because of the misperception that petrol can be started by a smoking cigarette. Um, so they did a lot of studies over 2000, I think, where they set up different ignition scenarios and, and tried to ignite petrol with a smouldering cigarette and not one of them ignited. Excellent, thank you very much. So scenario two, in scenario two, we should have the image up in a second, is a clip from um, the recent Traces programme in relation to a toaster that caught on fire. Scenario two, we should have the image up in a second, is a clip from um, the recent Traces programme in relation to a toaster that caught on fire. A barcode printed on a sticky label. You know how a label's glossy and smooth? Mm -hmm. The little spaces between the paper fibres are filled with kaolin clay, so it burns more slowly. Please with that, aren't you? Yes, I am. Two, we should have the image of the second. It's destroyed. A, a clip from uh, the recent traces, traces, traces program. If that's a deliberate work, you can get an address from it. You could. And the other thing that could be recoverable from inside folded cardboard, even as burnt as this, is fingerprints. Well, that would be a dream. We'll get cracking with that. Right. You know how you can't get this to stay clipped down if your toaster is switched off at the wall? I do. That's because it needs the flow of electricity to activate the electron magnet. That's what keeps it clicked down. When the electricity stops, after however long it takes to toast your toast, it's not magnetised anymore and the tray lift pops up. Is this rigged? Here you look. A twist tie has been wrapped around it. So the tray lift couldn't disconnect from the electromagnet. Huh. So why didn't the thermal protection device kick in and break the circuit? It couldn't. A paper clip's been put across it to hold it together, so the electricity kept flowing through. The toaster kept heating up. Exactly. So we have a um, rigged toaster there um, from the recent Traces program. Fact or fiction? Let's get to vote. Hopefully the voting screen will come up. We'll give you a few minutes to decide whether that was based on fact or fiction, and then we'll have a look at your votes. Ooh. Different, different picture to the last one. So for 75% uh, of you thought that was fact, um, and 25% of you thought it was fiction. For our panel, um, fact or fiction? Well, I uh, I can claim some sort of credit for this because uh, this is from uh, Traces, which is a series that uh, I developed uh, in collaboration with various other people, including Professor Nick Dade, um, uh, and the screenwriter, Amelia Bullmore, uh, who is even more of a stickler for accuracy than I am, spent a lot of time with Neve getting it right. The reason, the, the unique selling point, if you like, that uh, I proposed to the production company, Red Productions, uh, for this series was that so often we get things wrong when we do television dramas about forensic science. So often the facts get distorted, the information is not clearly presented. And I thought it would be quite interesting to do a drama where the forensic science was at the heart of it and the forensic science was accurate as accurate as it possibly could be in dramatic terms. And so uh, I spent time, and, 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 and Amelia Bullmore, the scriptwriter, spent a lot of time uh, trying to get to the heart of this. And uh, Neve came up with the idea of the toaster, which was a brilliant idea. Uh, and I had no idea when we started working on this about the, the barcodes on uh, deliveries that when the, when the cardboard packaging gets burned, there's still, because of the kaolin in the barcode, you can still read the barcode. So you can find 
who the package was originally sent to. And I thought that was very, very clever. And I love things like that. It's those little discoveries along the way that make me very excited. And Neve, Neve was really helpful. We couldn't have made this without her. You're very kind. And uh, the, 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 the thing about the, the clay or the kaolin that's in paper. So if you've got glossy paper, like magazine paper, and you try to burn it, it's not that easy to burn. Um, and the reason why it's glossy, like your label that's on the cardboard box, is because it contains about 30% clay. Um, and that's that the clay is added into the paper fibers in order to make it smooth and shiny. And that surface is much better at receiving some, some types of inks. And so that's why you have labels uh, made the way that they are. Um, but there's, it's certainly been the case in casework that you can see things like barcodes and so on surviving, um, even quite severe fires. Um, uh, and so that it was a, it was a, a, a really interesting as, as I was discussing, I think, both with yourself, Val, and also with them, um, with um, Amelia. Uh, and as you said earlier, it's those discussions that suddenly will tend you off in a direction that hooks where, where the, the creative juices that the writers have suddenly see something that's that they can hook onto, And that gives a really interesting plot twist or story. So that was where it came from. There was one point where Amelia and I were in a hotel in London. Um, taking a toaster apart so I could show her how the internal workings of it um, uh, happened and then I cut the plug off and gave it to the um, to the guy at the desk and asked him to just get rid of it for me. I don't know what they thought we were up to but there you go. Oh the glamour. <laughs> and of course the clays are an important aspect of soils with their being able to characterise using methods such as x-ray diffraction and and also the the quartz minerals for example are retained even after an object has been burned. So those two can be examined both microscopically and analytically. Excellent, thank you very much uh, for the panel. We'll go to our third scenario now. Um, and our third scenario is an image of um, a recovery of remains in a wooded area. So again, we'll ask you to vote. If it's image, does it look like it's fact or does it look like it's fiction? Give you a few minutes to vote and then we'll see what the results are. So we're quite we're closer here on this one. So we've got your poll is uh 31% of you thought it was fact, and 69% of you thought it was fiction. What do our panel say? <laughs> that takes you to an outdoor scene where um, you've got a scene protected from um, people coming into and out of that scene. However, um, it's not been appropriately protected in that only the, the roofs are covered. So if this is the recovery of remains, then um, the curious eye could peer into and expose potential um, material and, and human remains. And, and it's ultimately at the end of the day, um, it's the respect um, for the dead. And, and that should be properly um, screened from any, any eye. And indeed, that's one thing that um, the responsibility of the crime scene manager and the worrying thing is that media can can be very, very intrusive. Um, and in many cases, that's the reason why um, tents have to be put up. Um, it might not be necessary uh, for protection, but it is often necessary because of uh, media intrusion. Thank you very much. I'm going to move us on now. I know um, people are really interested. I've got a few minutes to ask questions. We've got a number of questions that have come in while we've been sitting here, So, but we are limited in time. So we'll probably only get to answer um, a couple of questions. So I'll do the first one for Val. 
Um, I'm fascinated to hear you talk about the way you convince readers about the authenticity of crime solving by providing authentic forensic science and balancing this with your creative freedom. I wonder what prompted you to choose to make the forensic science as authentic as possible, as opposed to other processes and practices, um, and what indicators you use to know when you've struck the right balance between authenticity and entertainment as an author? Well, I, su I suspect some of it was, was pure serendipity that I met a forensic scientist who was a great communicator at precisely the right point when forensic science was starting to assume a greater importance in, in detection. But also I think uh, I had the fortune of being educated in Scotland at a time when there was a great belief that you had as broad an education as possible. So when I came to do my hires, I did English, French and Latin, but I also did maths, physics and chemistry. And I was fascinated by, by the science, I, I particularly the chemistry. And so, uh, to me, it, was, it always felt like a good fit. It was an interesting fit. It was something I was interested in. So it wasn't uh, difficult or effortful to see the, the value of, of following what it was. And I guess um, I don't have any rule of thumb of when it's too much and when it's not enough. But in general, my, my feelings about research, whatever, the, whatever it is the research I put in, is that I always try to keep it as, as little as I need to put in to, to tell the reader what's happening. Uh, I don't, I don't just, I, I'm not, I try very hard not to wear my research heavily. Um, you know, some books you read and you think, yeah, they have, they've spent a week in a police car and we're going to know everything about it. I try not to do that kind of thing because I, I, I'm always trying to write the book I would like to read. So uh, I don't want to be bogged down in too much detail. So it's always keep it as crisp as you can. Excellent. Thank you very much. I'm going to do the last question to our, 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 our complete panel, because I think this is a really um, interesting question. Um, as, as those of us that work within forensic science, I'd be interested to hear what um, our forensic scientists answer this as well. I would like to ask you about the role of imagination regarding this topic. Writers and authors have the power to invent fictional worlds and narratives freely informed by the science. But do scientists need imagination to conceive of new lines of thinking in research and thought? Do scientists and academics get ideas from the fiction? Um, I'll have a stab. Um, I think it's a really interesting question. It's one of the things that we've found as we begin to work um, more um, in a collective community where we're, where we're not just siloed in the thinking of you know, a fire investigator or a drug chemist or, or whatever it might be, uh, and open our minds to creativity that um, enables us, I think, to be much better problem solvers and enables us to draw upon um, the, the other aspects of science engineering and other um, areas of inquiry to help us uh, address some of the, what, what are actually quite challenging problems sometimes in regards to understanding um, the nature of an alleged criminal event. I think what drives research, certainly for me, is casework. So when you come across something that's a little bit more intangible or a little bit more difficult or something where the answer isn't relatively straightforward. So for example, how does DNA move from surface to surface? If I shake somebody's hand and then grab a knife and, and stab someone, then their DNA could conceivably be on the knife, an object they've never touched. And our technology is good enough to pick that up now. So how do we unpick that from a research perspective? So I think for me, certainly, research has been driven by casework rather than by um, by other sort of conventional means. Lorna, do you have anything to add to that? Yes, I, I would agree um, with Neve, And I think it's vitally important that um, we are always working with the innovation, the new ideas and research is there at the backdrop of, of that practical um, forensic science. And it's important, for example, in um, the work that I do, it's not, it would not have been possible had it not been Scottish government funding to build up the databases and archives that allows me to make the evaluation of a comparison that I make between a question sample and a scene sample. I can only do that because I can put it in the context of what else and where else that sample may have come from. So we vitally need that robust science, that research that allows creativity of scientists to develop the new science that will be applied in 10, 20, 30 years time. I think I, think I would add um, that we also stand on the shoulders of the giants in science that have gone and engineering that have gone before us. So a lot of them Scottish. Um, so, you know, the, the, the geological and the soil surveys that have been done in Scotland, the botanical surveys, 
that have been done in Scotland and on the British Isles have created fantastic databases that forensic scientists could tap into if only they knew they were there. And some of them do and some of them don't. But it, this is all about sharing that knowledge and for us using it in a way that reflects a particular problem, what happened in the circumstances of this alleged set of events. Um, and to draw upon that knowledge is, is, is profoundly important, but it's also something that needs to be uh, made more visible, I think, to, to scientists working in the laboratories. And I, I, would, I would not want to be uh, arrogant enough to, to claim that people who just make stuff up uh, drive research. But what has been really exciting about the approach that you've done through the Leverhulme is the way that you have invited us into the tent to contribute to the development of ideas and to the development of communication of ideas. And that's been, I think, a really exciting process that has been happening a lot over the last dozen years or so. And I'm very glad to be part of that. Thank you all. I've got, I'm gonna do one very quick question for Val here. Um, Honestly, they're, they're, I'm, I'm sorry I'm not able to answer everybody's question or ask everybody's questions here, but Val, has there been any science information that you found out that has made you alter a whole storyline you were writing? And therefore it was the fault of the forensic scientists. <laughs> <laughs> it's not, 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 not necessarily been altering it in terms of the whole storyline, but certainly altering the way that I can do something. So often I've gone to a, a scientist that I know, digital forensic scientist or someone like me or someone like Lorna and said, here's the scenario I want to, to work with. Will this work? And then they'll go like, no, that's not going to work. And I just think, oh no. And then they go, but you could do this. So that's the, for, for me, the creativity of the scientist is extremely helpful when I have mad ideas that don't quite work. But then we turn up in your books, Val. Yes. <laughs> great characters that you yes. when, when you read it, you go, oh, goodness, that's bloody me. She's writing. <laughs> <laughs> Have you only ever seen yourselves as good guys, which is right, how it should be. <laughs> so I, we haven't got time, unfortunately, for any more questions, but thank you all. I'm going to just finish with a statement, uh, a comment that was actually put on the question board, because um, I think they probably said uh, this, this uh, um, has been said better than I could probably say it. It's not a question, but can I just say how marvellous it is to have a techie talk with all female presenters who are engaging and entertaining. As a female engineer, we don't see enough of this and you cannot be what you cannot see. Thank you. And I'd like to add my thanks to that, to all of the panel today, to Val, to Lorna and to Neve for um, helping us out and talking about their experiences and their understanding of forensic science and the way it's used. Well, thank you very much. Um, just to finish off with, please do visit the Curious website, the RSE website, um, to view any upcoming events, including panels and tea talk discussions, because there's going to be more of this through the rest of August. So thank you all for listening in. Thank you all for your questions. I'm sorry I didn't get to all of them um, today, but uh, thank you and enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you. Bye, thank everyone. You. Bye. 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 Bye.